Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive your word this night, written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We will take hold of it, be doers of it, and we thank you for all that you are going to bring forth this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you a series of messages regarding the importance of our members. We've talked about it's important what we hear, important what we see, it's important what we think upon, and we are talking about the importance of the words of our mouth. Talked about that on Sunday morning. Talked about the bridling of our tongue and how important it is to bridle our tongue on Sunday evening. Tonight we're going to continue to talk about this and especially about applying the words of our mouth in releasing God's power to accomplish His works, to see Him do the things He wants. We're going to review some of the important principles that we brought forth and talk about things of how we apply the word, areas where we need to put our mouth in operation. In Isaiah chapter 59, verse 21, As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, my spirit that's upon thee, and my words which I put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. You and I have come into covenant relationship. He wants the word of God in your mouth. He wants the Word of God in the mouth of your seed and in your seed seed as we train them up in the Word, teach them the truth. The covenant now that you and I have, we've come into relationship with them. We have the Spirit of Christ. We receive the Holy Spirit to dwell in us. and We need the Word in us so that He can accomplish the things that He wants in our life. Over in Psalms 50, Psalms 50, verse 16. Psalms 50, verse 16, he says, Unto the wicked God saith, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes? Or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? So he's telling them they can't do this because they're wicked. But the implication is this. Those people that are righteous, right with God, are to declare his statutes. They are to take the covenant in their mouth. Because how do you release these covenant promises to come to pass? You speak them into being. You use your mouth to speak the word of God that God responds to. And we talked about how God brought everything into being by speaking words. He said, let there be light, and there was light. He spoke words, and through faith, the words, spiritual words, brought all of the creation into being. We must understand that God's word is spirit, and it is life. John chapter 6, John chapter 6, verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they're spirit and they're life. We have to discern them spiritually, of course, and they are going to release things of the spirit. God wants you to understand when you speak God's word, you're putting spiritual law into operation and it is going to release his life and bring forth the things that he wants. Therefore, if you and I are going to keep the word in our mouth and speak the word, then we certainly have to get knowledge of God's word. If you don't have the knowledge of God's word, how are you going to put it in your mouth? How are you going to be able to speak it to bring forth promises? You won't be able to. We've got to get the word in us. That's why it says in Proverbs 5.2, that thou mayest regard discretion, and that thy lips may keep knowledge. Your lips, speaking forth words, are to keep knowledge, so that you're speaking things that are from God's Word. Because when you speak God's Word, that's spiritual law, and you're releasing His life, you're releasing what he, His Word is in order to bring promises to come to pass. Now, when you speak right words, which is absolutely essential, it is going to release great mighty force. In Job chapter 6, verse 25, notice what he says. How forcible are right words. When you speak right words, it releases God's power, His might, His force to accomplish His promises, also to conquer enemies in our life, to release the authority and the power of God to bring forth victory. 
So we need to have the knowledge of God. We've got to have the right words that we're going to speak. They're going to release His force. And we talked about how we had to bridle our tongue, many scriptures on it, but we need to realize that in your mouth is the ability to release death or life. Proverbs 18, verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. You want to be sure, of course, you speak words that are going to release life, not death. But you can speak death if you speak the wrong things. We've got to be sure we're speaking the things that are in line with the Word of God. Now, as you speak His Word that is spiritual law, according to the knowledge of God, and you speak the right words before Him, then God is going to take notice of that. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 15, He says, Thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth. When God's words are in your mouth, God's going to be with your mouth because you're speaking the things that he says. You're releasing him because he is the word and you're putting him in operation. I'll be with his, thy mouth and with his mouth and will teach you what you shall do. So God wants us to get this word in us. Now, as the word is in us and it's in our mouth, it is also to be in our heart. And that is important to realize. We see in Romans chapter 10, verse 8, What saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, but also it's to be in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. If you've got the word in your heart, you have faith, and you speak it with your mouth, you release the power of God that's resident in it. This is what you put in operation, and you have to understand this is spiritual power being released through your faith, which is a spirit of faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13 says this, We, having the same spirit of faith, if you're born again, you got the spirit of Christ, and you have the same spirit of faith. The spirit of faith is the faith of Jesus Christ. Every one of us got the same, has the same spirit of faith. So what are we supposed to do with it? According as it's written, I believe, therefore have I spoken. We believe and therefore speak. When you believe God's word, that's not all you need to do. Some people just believe the word, but they don't put their mouth in operation. You need to speak to release him, to accomplish your, to release your faith and for him to accomplish the promises of God in our life. And what are you going to speak? You're going to speak his spiritual law. You're going to speak the word of God. We see a scripture over in Job 22, over in verse 28, where it says, Thou shalt also decree a thing. You're going to decree, you're going to decree a thing, which is God's word. Remember, you're a king, and you're going to speak his decrees from the king of kings. And it shall be established unto you, and the light shall shine upon your ways. Otherwise, God is going to see this be established and the, it'll shine upon your ways, which means God's blessing will come forth because you can decree things. You can speak things into being. You must also understand, in order to release God to accomplish His work, you are going to speak commanding words. Look what it says in Isaiah 45, 11. Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and His Maker, Ask me of things to come concerning my sons, and concerning the work of my hands, command ye me. You want to see the work of his hands be done? You're going to command him. You're not making him do something. You're commanding him by speaking commanding words. That's why he told us to speak to the mountain. That's why he told us to cast out the demons. That's why he told us to speak these things into being. You, are, you speak the word, you're commanding him because he's the word, remember. And you're going to command the work of his hands. Many people are waiting for God to do something instead of speaking to release him to accomplish his promises and bring forth what he purposes. Another thing you must realize is Isaiah 49, verse 2. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. Your mouth is like a sword which is going to smite the enemies. He wants you to smite the enemies. He wants you to conquer them all and see them be put underfoot. Also, it's important that you understand anything that the enemy comes against you with, you can stop its works. 
Isaiah 54, 17, when people speak against you or the devil speaks against you on negative things, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou, that you, shall condemn it. That's the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness of me, saith the Lord. Otherwise, don't let things that people speak affect you adversely. You condemn those tongues. And you only speak things, you don't receive, receive anything that's not in line with the word. You only receive the things that are, that are in line with the word, but not contrary to it. You condemn everything that's not of the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 57, another thing that's important. When you speak God's word, what's he going to do? He's going to perform it. Look at the scripture in Isaiah 57, 19. I create the fruit of the lips. Who does the speaking? You and I do, through the lips. What happens? He creates and brings those things into being. You can speak the promises of God into being as you put the word of God in your mouth. Another scripture we looked at that's very important to understand is every time you are speaking, you are putting something forth in the realm of the spirit, whether it's good or whether it's bad. You want to be sure you speak right things. Psalms 45 Verse 1 and 2. The latter part of this verse says, My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Your tongue is the pen, which is like a marking stick, of a ready writer, someone who's ready to inscribe it and, and declare this, or like a skillful scribe. That's exactly what happens. Your tongue is writing the things that you are speaking. Verse 2. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. And how would grace be poured into your lips? When you speak the word. Something in line with the favored words from God. And what's God going to do? Therefore God hath blessed thee forever. Otherwise, you released him by having grace in your lips. And God performs it by bringing his blessings. And notice it says God will bless you forever. It has long enduring effect. If we'll just put the right things in our mouth. So you need to put the word of God in your mouth. This is exactly what Jesus was doing in his ministry. How did he operate? He spoke the word of God that the Father gave him, always in line with the word. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, speaking of Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things, everything, by the word of his power. The word for word here is the word rhema, which refers to that which is a something, a thing that is spoken. So he's talking about upholding all things by the spoken word of his power. And it sounds like a funny way to say it from an English standpoint. Wouldn't you say the power of his word? But no, it's important for the way it's said. The spoken word of his power. Where is the power? Resident in the word. How do you put it in operation? You speak it. The spoken word of his power that's resident in the word puts it in operation. And that's how he's upholding all things. That's how he did it. That's the same thing that you and I are to do. Another thing is you're applying the word. Everything that you do, you're going to do it in the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 3. We see over here in verse 6. He said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He spoke words in the name of Jesus, commanding words. Took him by the right hand, lifted him up. Immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. He leaped up, stood and walked and entered with them in the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. You always do things in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus puts him in operation through the high priestly ministry of Jesus to accomplish his word. Look what it says in Colossians 3.17. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus. See, Jesus is in a high priestly ministry. You speak in his name to bring his high priestly ministry in operation where he takes the word, confesses it before the Father, and he confesses it before the angels who hearken to it to bring it to pass. So you're going to do everything in the name of Jesus. 
And also when you do speak, whatever aspect of speaking, you must do it with a courage and a boldness. In Acts chapter 4, verse 29, Now, Lord, behold their threatenings, grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. You're going to speak boldly by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. When they prayed, the place was shaken together where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness, with boldness, with confidence, not holding anything back, knowing what God will accomplish. You need to know that God's word is the truth, and he watches over his word to perform it. So there's a lot of important principles we've seen just so far before we begin to look at specific things that he wants our mouth to be put in operation. You're in covenant relationship with God. The word of God is to be in your mouth and in your heart. We're talking about spiritual words according to the knowledge of God. And they are forcible when you put right words. You're going to release life. God will be with you according to your mouth. As you believe the word and you speak, you're putting your spirit of faith in operation. You can decree things that will be established to you. The light will shine upon your ways. You're going to command the work of his hands. Your mouth's going to be like a sharp sword that's going to smite the enemies. You can condemn anything that's been spoken against you and stop its works. You, he will create the fruit of your lips as long as you're speaking right things. And what you're speaking is being recorded in the Spirit. You're writing, it's being written in the Spirit. You pour grace into your lips. God will bless you forever. That's how Jesus controlled everything. He upheld all things by the spoken word of his power. And you're going to do everything through the name of Jesus, and you are going to do it with boldness and confidence in God, knowing that he is a performer of his word. We want to put our mouth in operation. One of the things that we need to do is that with our mouth is God wants us to praise and to worship him. If you are not a praiser and a worshiper of him, you're not carrying out the ministry of the priesthood in the New Testament. 1 Peter 2, verse 5, this is one aspect of it. It says, We also as lively stones, being born again, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, and we offer up spiritual sacrifices. We're under a different covenant now. We're not under the old covenant. We're under the new covenant. And the old covenant had all of its physical sacrifices. Do we offer up those today? Of course not. No, because Jesus, our sacrifice, has accomplished the redemption and the old covenant is finished. We are now under the new covenant. And is the covenant made for man after the spirit with all of its spiritual applications? And so, do we offer up sacrifices? Yes, we still do. Some people think, well, I didn't know I, didn't know I was supposed to offer up sacrifices. Yes, you are. You're going to, one of the sacrifices, the sacrifice of praise. God wants you to be a praiser and a worshiper of him. As you praise and worship him and minister to him, then he will minister back unto you. If you won't praise and worship him, why should he minister back unto you? You won't acknowledge him for who he is. We're to worship the Father in spirit and truth. In fact, we must worship him now, the word says. And we are to be praising and worshiping him. We see in Psalms, and this is your mouth. Otherwise, he doesn't want you to be a spectator. He wants you to be a participant in singing and praising God. Psalms 34, verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. God wants you to be praising Him throughout your day. And we talk about the praise continually in your mouth. This word praise here is the word tehillah in the Hebrew. And it really refers to a spontaneous praise singing your halal or your praise unto God. Whether it's going to be from words of a song or something that would be spontaneous out of your heart. Otherwise, God he doesn't want us just to sing when we're having a time here of praise and worship. He wants you to be praising Him throughout your day. Spontaneous praise coming forth out of you is to continually be in your mouth <laughs> at all times. <clears throat> we see over in Psalm 63, Verse 5, my soul shall be satisfied with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. I mean, God wants you to have joy when you're praising him. You're not just going through the motions. 
You're to praise Him. Think about the words. I always tell people, think about the words that we're singing and really participate in them as you're offering up a sacrifice of praise or whatever you're singing. You're thinking about what you're singing as you're ministering it unto the Lord as well as what He's done for you. you and you have joy over what He's accomplished. We sing things that are in line with the Scriptures to, which is not only ministering to the Lord, but it's also ministering to you at the same time. It's important that you learn to praise and worship God. In fact, we see over in Hebrews, in chapter 13, verse 15, By Him let us therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to His name. He wants your mouth to be speaking thanksgiving unto Him, to give praise and worship unto the Lord. That's a sacrifice of praise. Sacrifice costs you something. It means you're going to have to give forth something from yourself. He wants you to give out a sacrifice of praise and minister unto Him. When you minister to Him, He will minister back unto you. And you must understand that when you are praising and worshiping God, Ephesians chapter 5, in verse 18 it says, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, being filled with the Spirit, the word filled here happens to be a present tense in the Greek. The present tense in the Greek means continuous ongoing action. So the way you would translate this is be continuously being filled with the Spirit. Otherwise, you're not filled with the Spirit continuously unless you're doing what this is about to tell you. Now, there's one thing that's important you understand. Being filled with the Spirit has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in you. There's been teaching out there that pray, prays for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit, but they're not understanding. And I wrote a book called The Difference Between Baptism of the Holy Spirit, Receiving of the Holy Spirit, and Filling of the Holy Spirit. Very important to understand so you understand that those are three different things. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is actually the new birth when you find, it, find out what it says in Scripture. And the receiving of the Holy Spirit is where the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in us. And then the filling of the Holy Spirit happened in the Old Testament era as well as in the New Testament and always for, was for service of the Lord. God wants us to be continually filled with the Spirit. And here it tells you one of the ways speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Notice it has a dual effect. You're singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, but where else is it? What else is happening? At the same time, you're speaking to yourselves in the psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to bring a filling of the Holy Spirit as well as to sow the Word of God in you. That's why we only sing songs that are in line with the Scriptures. We won't sing any of, the, any of these popular songs that are not in line with the Word of God. They're a waste of time. We only want to seek, sing things that are either directly the Word of God or linking scriptural principles together that are always in line with the Word, and that is very important. So praise and worship unto God is very important. He wants you to have the praises of God in your mouth ministering to Him. If you won't praise and worship God, why should He do anything for you? You see, when you give out, it's given back to you. You minister to Him, He is going to minister back unto us. Another thing that we must realize is what our mouth is to do, is that we are to be a blessing with our mouth to whoever we come in contact with. In Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, over in verse 44, I say unto you, love your enemies, Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. How do we do everything in the New Testament? We always give a person what they have need of, not what they deserve. If you give them what they deserve, you make yourself a judge, and we're not supposed to judge. Instead, we have give them what they have need of. Our enemies, we're not going to retaliate against them. We're going to love our enemies. Does that mean that they won't have any uh, accountability for what they've done? Oh no, they won't get away with it. Every man's going to reap what he sows. But you are not to be the judge. You are to walk in love towards everybody. You are to do good 
to those that hate you and pray for them, but you're to bless those that curse you. He wants your mouth to be a blesser. Bless. Speak the things of the Word of God. You know, some people have thought, that, oh, I thought we're supposed to return curses to people. No, that was in the Old Testament. Do we return curses in this day? No, we do not. Romans chapter 12, verse 14, Bless them that persecute you, bless and curse not. You do not curse people. You bless them. You speak good things. You pray for them. You love them. We do not return curses, which is in Psalms 109. They were cursed, turns, curses to the sender in the Old Testament. Remember, they would love their, their, the neighbor, but they'd hate their enemy, and they'd return curses. But that's not in the New Testament. It's changed. We're under a higher covenant. Better, better covenant, better promises, and a higher law. You are to bless and not to curse. In fact, we see the problem that was addressed in James chapter 3. These people, and remember James was written to the Hebrews, you know, and so these guys were still operating under the Old Testament law, which is a mistake. Verse 9, he says, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. No, we don't release blessing and cursing. We just release blessing. God wants you to be a blessing. He wants you to speak good things. Don't speak things that are condemning people or negative. You want to speak blessings upon that particular person. 1 Peter chapter 3 over in verse 9, we're not to be rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing. That's what we give out. Knowing that you are there unto called that you should inherit a blessing. You want to inherit a blessing? Speak forth and give out blessing. If you don't give it out, it's not going to come back unto you. Now, you and I are to be a blessing so that then we can inherit the blessing that God has for us. He that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. He only wants you to speak right things. So you're going to speak words of blessing over people's lives, and speaking directly to them. Don't be speaking negative things or you aren't going to inherit the blessing of God. So we've got to have our mouth so we praise God, ministering to Him. We also, in dealing with people, we speak blessing to them at all times. Now, in the area of intercession, God wants to use you in intercession to conquer the works of the enemy. We see over in Isaiah chapter 59, we talk about the application of our mouth. Verse 16, Isaiah chapter 59, verse 16, he says, He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. The intercessor says he's the one who falls upon the enemies to their destruction. This word intercessor here is a word pagah, which when you look it up in Strong's, it means that you are going to strike at and drive at with persistence. It is translated fall upon, where they fell upon their enemies to their destruction. And to light upon, like you're lighting upon a mark to reach that you didn't even know you were going to run and come in contact with. An intercessor is going to engage in spiritual warfare against the enemies of God to destroy their works. Look what it says. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness has sustained him. So what is the intercessor going to do? He puts on righteousness as a breastplate. He puts on a helmet of salvation upon his head. What's that? That's talking about the armor of God, isn't it? We're going to put on the word of God in us, the armor of God for warfare. That We're going to speak and release the power of God. We've talked about how we put on the armor of God through the word. It causes us to have power resident within us. And then we pray with all manner of prayer to release the power of God out of us with mighty force. So... We're going to get the armor of God through the word in us. And notice, it says he put on garments of vengeance for clothing. That means he is a vessel for God's vengeance against God's enemies. You're going to smite the enemies. Intercessors enter into warfare, and they are going to fight in the spirit against these evil spirits. 
and he's clad with zeal as a cloak. He's zealous. I mean, he's really into it. He's going to be zealous in prayer, zealous in intercession, with vengeance. You're going to be striking these enemies to bring the destruction upon them. Look what it goes on in verse 18. According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. To the islands he'll pay recompense. Otherwise, God's fury comes against his adversaries and enemies. Now, who are we talking about? We're not talking about people. We're talking about the evil spirits that we are fighting against. Because who are we fighting against? We'll get to that in just a minute. It's the, all these evil spirits in the heavenlies. But we also want to look at this. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, that means he comes to attack. The Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Now, how does the Spirit of the Lord lift up a standard against him? Because you, the intercessor, with vengeance and zeal, with the armor of God on, you start speaking with authority to bring fury against his enemies and to bring destruction upon these spirits. This word here, or lift up a standard against him. It happens to be in the Hebrew, there's different stems for the Hebrew verbs. It's in the polel stem. When we look back at what the polel stem means, it means, if you see, look here, it means to drive at. That's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to drive at the enemy to his destruction. And who is, who's going to do, accomplish The Spirit of the Lord is going to operate through you to drive at the enemy. You're going to destroy the works of the enemy. And that's what God wants. Because where's our battle? Our battle is not against people. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Not against people. But against principalities against powers, or this means authorities, against rulers of the darkness of this age, doesn't mean world, it's the word aeon, which means age, against spiritual wickedness in high places. These are all evil spirits that are operating in different levels of authority under Satan, operating in the heavenlies, ruling over countries, cities, households, places, governments, and so forth. You and I have dominion. We have to attack these spirits and destroy their works. If we are just doing, looking at things in the natural, we're going to miss the whole boat. This battle is a spiritual battle against spiritual enemies. And you and I are going to wrestle against them, which is like a, a contest, a spiritual contest against them in the realm of the spirit. And you and I are going to bring destruction against them as we operate. And you're, that's why your mouth is so important. You remember, you're, one of the things your mouth's going to do, it's a sharp sword. You're going to speak this God's power, release his authority and might against all of these enemies to see destruction come upon them. It is also important that you understand the position that God has put us in. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 10. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms. You're in Jesus Christ. Remember, we're seated in heavenly places with Christ, far above all principality, power, might, and name that's named. You're in a position of authority, and you can conquer every enemy in your life. Jeremiah 1.10, See, I have this day set thee over the nations, over the kingdoms. You can take dominion over every evil spirit operating in the heavenlies, wherever it is. There's no distance in prayer, remember. And what are you going to do? You're going to root them out. You're going to pull them down. You're going to destroy them. You're going to throw them down. You're going to do violence against them. We've got to enter into violent warfare intercession to destroy the works of the enemy. This isn't praying some prayers to God to do such and such, the Father to do such and such, without attacking the enemies. We've got to attack the enemies in the realm of the Spirit. You and I have dominion. And if we do not do that, we will not see changes come in the realm of the spirit. We've got to attack these spirits as well as you're not only going to throw all the evil down, but you're going to build and plant the things of God. And that's what he wants. You and I can do these things. See, you are 
the one who God is going to use mightily to bring forth what he purposes. Another, another scripture that's important, it's over in Matthew chapter 16. For understanding what you do with your mouth. Matthew 16, 19. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, it says. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now we need to stop and take a look at this for a moment. First of all, the word heaven is plural in the Greek. That makes all the changes. You won't find it hardly any translations except where Young's puts it, heavens, and it's correct. It's heavens, heavens, and heavens. We can show it to you in the Greek, right here. You may not know Greek. This is Scrivener's translation of the Greek, which is the basis for the King James Version. When I put the cursor over this word, this is the word arenon, which is the word for heaven, I want you to notice that it's a plural. It's a noun, a genitive case, if you know anything about Greek, masculine, plural. It's not singular, it's plural. How about the next one? Here's the next one where it's a, in the dative case, erenos. And this word, heaven, noun, dative, masculine, plural, not singular. And then we come down to the last one here, which is right here. And this again is in the plural. All three are in the plural. Why they haven't translated this is beyond me. But Young's translated it correct. Heavens, heavens, heavens. That changes the whole picture. Are we talking about the kingdom of heaven where God is? No. We're talking about the kingdom of the heavenlies where all the evil spirits have been operating. Principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, spiritual wickedness. That's who we're going to come against. Now, you and I have the keys. What are keys? Means of access into something. I got the keys, I can get into the door. You know, I can open up something. Keys are means of access to the kingdom, which is the rule and the reign of the heavens. See, God's going to use you and me to release him, to accomplish what he purposes. So, you and I have the keys, the means of access to the rule and the reign of the heavens. So now you and I are to do something. Whatsoever thou, that's you and me, might bind, it really means, it's not shall bind in the sense of a, a future tense. This is a subjunctive mood. And if you're here for the first time, or haven't heard me talk about this, don't be overwhelmed, we explain all this. You have to know this, though, and know what's being said. It is in the subjunctive mood, which in the Greek is not a factual statement. It is a conditional statement, which means this is a condition. Whatsoever you might bind, if you meet the conditions, you got to do this. It's not going to happen automatically. Whatsoever you might bind would be the way you translate this, or as Young's brings it out, mayest bind. He's done a very good job on this. Whatsoever thou might bind on earth, where are you and I? We're on earth. Shall be bound in heaven, in the heavens. Now we've got to also unravel this. You would think that bound is the main verb here, and that shall be are like helper verbs, right, in English? It's not so in the Greek here. There's a word for bound. Notice it's this word, deo, a form of it. But when I put the cursor over the word be, this is another word, the to be verb. So we got two different verbs here. We're not talking about just one verb with helpers. We got two different verbs. And this verb, the be verb, is the main verb in that phrase because it's what's called the indicative mood, which is a factual statement. The word bound is what's called a participle a participle is something that is translated normally having been bound, as Young's brings it out. So he says that whatsoever you might bind on earth shall be, as Young's brings it out, 
having been bound in the heavens. That's literally what it's talking about. Well, this changes the whole thing. This makes it showing you what's going on. You bind on earth, it shall be. That means it's going to happen. That's a strong statement. It's going to happen. Having been bound in the heavens. Who does the work in the heavens? Angels. Angels do the work. When you and I speak from our position on earth, angels hearken to the voice of the word and go and perform it. And they are going to accomplish this in the realm of the spirit. We see the angels will fight against these demons. Remember with Daniel's prayer? It took 21 days for the angel to finally be able to get through to deliver the message to him. But there was a prince, there was an evil prince that was hindering him. And he said, I, I've come from the first day, but there was this evil prince that was hindering. That shows you there's warfare that goes on in the realm of the spirit. So these angels are going to go into operation and they're going to bind and tie up and stop these spirits' activity in the heavenlies. The word bind simply means, come back to this, the word bind is the word deo, which means to bind or to tie something up. You bind them. If I bind somebody, I tie them up and they can't do anything. If I bind a prisoner, I bound him up, he's going to be, not going to be able to go anywhere. So you're going to bind these spirits and you're going to stop their works. Then the next part says, And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. It's the same thing in all cases. Whatsoever you might loose, it's a subjunctive mood, on the earth shall be, same thing, having been loosed in the heavens. It's all the same in the Greek. So what this is telling you, what does the word loose mean? Loose means to untie. I can untie the hold of spirits that are controlling a nation or a government or a household or a city or a place or whatever is going on in the realm of the spirit. So, this is, this is pretty powerful. If evil spirits are who we're fighting against, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, and we don't know that we can confront them or we don't do what's necessary to confront them, they're going to operate unhindered. And nothing's going to happen. You can pray for the Father all day to do things, but if you haven't used your authority and entered in as an intercessor to come against them and stop their works, cast them down, throw them down, root them out, destroy them, they're going to keep operating. This is why we have a problem in this nation as well as the nations of the world, because Christians have not understood this, and they haven't taken their place as intercessors to attack these spirits and destroy their works. So you and I have the keys to the rule and the reign of the heavens. We can bind to tie up these spirits from our position on earth. It shall be, having been bound in the heavens. And we can loose and untie their hold from earth that unties their hold in the heavenlies over a place. That's why we got to take dominion. We got to use our authority. We loose and untie the spirits hold over this nation, over this government. We loose and untie their hold over the Congress and over all these places and positions of authority that are causing us to be in the state that we're in. It's a spiritual battle. We can destroy the works of the enemy. You must understand another scripture that goes along with this. And you're, see, this all involves your mouth, doesn't it? Because how do you bind them? You speak with your mouth. I bind you spirits. Let's say I'm binding spirits of, of rebellion over a nation. I bind the spirits of rebellion in the name of Jesus. Or maybe, I, maybe there's some witchcraft curses that have come against our government. I bind those spirits and I loosen and untie their hold in the name of Jesus. I'm doing this with my mouth. And then I'm going to cast it down, throw it down, get rid of them. Once you bind them, you're going to do something else. And I loosen and untie their hold. I'm not going to leave them up there. We're going to throw them down. Kick them out of where they are. That's why we can root them out, pull them down, throw them down, as it said in Jeremiah 1. And that's what he wants. Now look at this scripture in Matthew eleven twelve, 12. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. 
if you read that, what it looks like, it says, the kingdom of heaven. Well, is that talking about God's kingdom? Is suffering violence? And the violent are taking it by force? Is somebody overthrowing the kingdom of heaven? No. Why do, what's the problem? The word heaven is heavens. It is plural. It's not talking about the kingdom of heaven. It's talking about the kingdom of the heavens. Here it is again. This is the word for heaven. As you can see, and notice it again is plural. So, people don't understand what's going on if they don't look these things up. From the days of John the Baptist till now, the kingdom of the heavens, what's, what's the kingdom of the heavens? All these principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness, and heavenly places that are operating. The rule and the reign of the heavens is suffering violence. It is? Well, who's bringing the violence against this rule and the reign of the heavens? The church. You and I are to bring the violence against these principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness. To cast them down, throw them down, and destroy them. How are you going to do it? With your mouth. You're going to use your mouth because your mouth puts God in operation, see? But you've got to have knowledge of these things, and you've got to engage in the warfare. And the violent, that's you and me, are taking it by force or seizing control of the rule and the reign of the heavens. Because of the fact that the church has either not known this, which is most cases, or they haven't engaged in the warfare, no wonder we have the problems that we have. We have authority and dominion. We can stop all the works of the enemy. But we haven't understood these things. And we haven't engaged in the warfare. Intercession is not praying for God to do such and such for so and so. Yes, you're going to pray for God to accomplish things. That's part of what we pray for. But intercession is really, it means to strike at and drive at with persistency, to destroy the works of the enemy, and to see these spirits be cast out of the heavenlies to stop their works in people's lives. That is what we need. Warfare, intercession, the people we're going to move into. And you and I have authority and dominion, and we are to release this authority with our mouth. So what do I say? You have authority and dominion? I bind even the, whatever spirits it might be. I bind the principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places in the name of Jesus, do everything in the name of Jesus. I loose and untie their hold over this nation, over this city, over this government, over this household, whatever it might be. I cast it down, I throw it down, I root it out, I destroy its works in the name of Jesus. Speaking those words does what? Puts the angels in operation. Angels will go into operation to carry out this mighty work. Psalms. 103 tells you about what angels do. Verse 20. Bless the Lord, ye his angels. It says that they excel in strength. The word excel actually is the word gabor, which means are strong and mighty. They're strong and mighty. The angels are strong and mighty. The word strength is really the word power, koak, and it refers to a manifested power being released. This is why Young's did a pretty good job when he said mighty in power. And they are. Young's literal translation, the best New Testament and, and really the best overall Bible that I know of. Here it says, they are mighty in manifested power and strength. So what, that means you're gonna, they, they're ready to do something. What do they do? They do his commandments. So the, what do they do? They do the word. Well, how are they put in operation? They hearken to the voice of his word. Aha, that means they gotta hear something. When they hear the voice of the word, they're gonna go forth and they're gonna carry it out. When you pray in the name of Jesus, Jesus takes that which you pray and confesses it before the angels. Luke chapter 12, verse eight, indicates. Also I say unto you, whosoever shall confess me, and whose Jesus is the word, so we, every time you confess the word before men, 
Him will the Son of Man confess before the angels of God. The principle is this. Whatever you speak before the Lord, to the Father in the name of Jesus, Jesus, who's the Son of Man, He confesses it before the angels. He confesses it before the angels, and what do the angels do? They hearken to the voice of the Word, and they go forth and carry it out. Angels are performers of the Word. So important. We've got to understand that. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, talking about angels, and the subject here, angels, he says, are, not, are they not all ministering spirits? They're serving spirits. Sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. Who's an heir of salvation? We are. So that means they're going to minister for us, the heirs of salvation. They're going to bring our salvation, our inheritance, our healing, our deliverance, our victory into manifestation. But you've got to put them in operation. They're put in operation when you speak right. This is why we've got to learn to put the word in our mouth. Some people think put the word in mouth just means quote a couple of scriptures here and there. No. It's putting the word in your mouth as far as acting upon it to release God by doing what the scriptures say. So, you and I are going to engage in this. Intercession means to strike at, to drive at, to fall upon to their destruction with persistency. So you do it consistently. You put the armor of God on, you are now are going to have, have the vengeance, the garments of vengeance. You're clothed with zeal as a cloak. I'm zealous in warfare. I'm going to repay fury to the enemy, enemies and recompense to them. I'm going to strike and drive at them with violence coming at them with violence to bring destruction against them. And I've been set over the nations and the kingdoms, and I, can, I have the key, means, the keys of the rule and the reign of the heavens. We all do, see. Therefore, from my position and your position on earth, you can pray to affect what's going on in the heavens. You can bind, to tie them up, stop their works in the name of Jesus. The angels will hearken to it. They'll go up there, and they will fight against those spirits and bind them up. You can loose and untie their hold where they've had dominion. You loose and untie their hold in the name of Jesus. And those angels will loose, untie their hold over wherever they are. Well, you don't stop there. You cast them down. You throw them down. You root them out. You destroy their works. You get rid of them out of the heavenlies. We don't want them staying there. We cast them down. Get rid of them. You say, well, how in the world did they get there to begin with? Because of the sins of the people. So as we remit, this is the other thing you do in order to do this, is you remit sins as an intercessor. John chapter 20. See, the devil can work because of sin. Whosoever sins you remit, that means to send away its effect. They're remitted unto them. They're sent away. Since the devil has gotten all of his control in areas because of the sins, well, we, have, we can remit the sins that have allowed them to get in their operation. And we remit the sins. We do this not only in intercession. We also do this when we're working in deliverance, where we remit the sins and iniquities of the forefathers that have affected you and caused evil spirits to come in you from inheritance. We remit their sins. And then we begin to cast out the spirits, see? Because the sins is why they're able to come into you. Same way why they're in the heavenlies. How do these spirits get over this country and all this? Because of the sins. You can see that. I've had testimonies before of people who moved into the Hollywood, Los Angeles area, and they all of a sudden they had marital problems and all kinds of sexual problems and all kinds of things. Because those spirits rule and reign over that place big time. Nobody's cast them down. Plus all the sins are allowing them to operate. You've got to take dominion. We've got to get in and start using our authority with our mouth. See, the words of your mouth are so important. It's not just knowing this and, oh yeah, the words of my mouth are important. About, I see how they're supposed to be right before the Lord. We've got to know what to do with our mouth. You get the knowledge of God. You get God's word in you. You start applying these things. You start using your authority. Bind. Loose. And untie, throw down, cast down, root out, fall upon them to their destruction. Drive at them. Cast them out of the heavenlies. 
We do the same thing in deliverance. We cast them out of us to get set free from the evil spirits. We have authority and dominion. We have dominion. We're supposed to use our authority to stop the works of the enemy. Another thing, an aspect with intercession, is praying in tongues. God wants everybody to have their prayer language. If you don't have your prayer language yet, God wants you to have it. Now, one thing you've got to understand, first you get born again, you receive the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Then you receive the Holy Spirit afterward who comes to dwell in you. Once you have the Holy Spirit in you, you have the ability to pray in tongues. It is a spiritual prayer language. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians 14, 15. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit. That's one way you can pray. And I will pray with the understanding also. The word understanding, by the way, is noose, and it really means mind. It should, should have been translated that because it's mind, 24 uses, 20 to, 21 times correctly translated mind, and that's what it actually means. So, I'm going to pray. There's two ways I can pray. I can pray with my spirit, and I can pray with my mind. Praying with my mind is according to the knowledge that I have from the Word of God, and it's going to be in my own language. What does it mean to pray with my spirit? Well, remember, you get a new spirit when you're born again, the Spirit of Christ. Then when you receive the Holy Spirit, where does He come to dwell? In your spirit. So the Holy Spirit is dwelling in your spirit, and what happens? Now you can pray with your spirit. And how do you do that? You do that with a prayer language that God gives to you, which is tongues that you don't understand, but they're coming from the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. It is a spiritual prayer language. 1 Corinthians 14, 14. If I pray in an unknown tongue, unknown to your mind, my spirit prayeth. That's what praying with your spirit is. But my mind, same word, is unfruitful. Why would I want to pray something that I don't know what I'm praying in my mind? Because you're not praying, when you're, when you're praying with your spirit, you're not praying according to your known, your knowledge, what you know in your mind. You're praying according to the Holy Spirit. You're praying with your spirit where he dwells and the language comes from the Holy Spirit. You're praying with what the Holy Spirit knows. He knows everything. You and I know a drop in the bucket compared to what he knows. He knows what to pray in every situation. You and I may know some things, but we won't know everything, that's for sure. We need to pray in tongues. Now, you have this prayer language once you have the Holy Spirit in you, and you can pray in tongues at will. At will. Notice he says, I will pray with the Spirit. I will do it at will. You can do it anytime you want. My prayer language is this. What am I doing? I'm speaking with my spirit. I'm not speaking with my mind. I'm praying with my spirit. Speaking words that are coming from the Holy Spirit within me. Do I know what I said? No. Who knows what I said? The Holy Spirit does, and it goes right up to God, and He knows exactly what's been prayed. In fact, it's important to understand in verse 2, he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. So what are you doing? You're speaking to God. You're not speaking to men. You're speaking to God. And notice, no man understands him because you're not speaking in a normal language. You're speaking in a spiritual language. What are you doing? In the spirit, you are speaking mysteries or means hidden things or divine secrets, things that you don't know. God you say, well, why wouldn't God tell me what to pray? He's, gonna, well, let's, he's not going to tell you everything. He'll tell you things he wants to tell you, but he knows everything. He's not going to be able to tell you everything, but you can release him who knows everything, and he knows what to pray for in every situation when you and I don't know what all to pray for. In fact, Romans chapter 8, verse 26 Notice what this says. Likewise, the Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit, helps our infirmities. The word infirmities means weakness. 
Now, whenever this word is used, it could mean weakness of the body or it could mean weakness of the mind. So how do we know what it is? By context. Look at what it says. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, or this means as necessary and how we must. So since we know not what we should pray for, what's it talking about? Our mind, isn't it? He helps our weaknesses of mind, for we know not what we should pray for as we must or as necessary. This word means, it's translated must the majority of the times, 58 times. And it, it, from Strong's, if you look it up, it really means necessary as binding. It comes from the, group, the root word deo, and this is the word die, similar to it, where we saw about binding. It was a similar word. So, we now, the Holy Spirit, will help our weaknesses of mind so that we don't know what all to pray for as we must or as necessary as binding. It's a covenant word. What does that tell you? You and I need to pray as we must. Well, how can I pray as I must? Well, I'm going to pray according to my knowledge with my mind, but also I need to pray with the Holy Spirit, with the Spirit praying in tongues. And what's going to happen? The Holy Spirit himself, or really it's, it's itself, it's a himself, he's a person, makes intercession for us with what? Groanings which cannot be uttered. And this refers to, when you look it up in the Greek, it refers to that which is not expressed in normal words, something that's uttered that is not in regular speech. So what is that talking about? Spiritual words, not in our normal speech, and that's exactly what praying in tongues is. Spiritual words, spiritual speech, which is coming out of the, from the Holy Spirit within. So this is talking about you praying in a spiritual prayer language. So, the Holy Spirit will make intercession for us through this prayer language that we have. And he that searches the hearts knows what's the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to, it says the will of God, but notice the will of is italicized. It literally says according to God. That's even stronger. What does that tell you? The intercession is according to God, the Holy Spirit. So you're releasing God, the Holy Spirit, to pray through you. You're a vessel for God to flow through. How do I do that? You got to get your prayer language, which everybody has once you have the Holy Spirit. If you don't have it, God wants you to get your prayer language. It's available for everybody. And then you use your prayer language. So what do I do when I pray? I'm going to pray with my understanding, my mind, according to the Word, but I'm also going to pray in tongues. This is why when we have our intercession meetings, we pray in tongues, and whoever else will be praying English things about what, they're, what, what we're praying for, but we continue to pray in tongues, and then when they finish praying with their mind, someone else will come along and pray with their mind of the things that God is giving them to pray, while well, everybody's still praying in tongues, so we're constantly releasing what the Holy Spirit would pray through us. And we're also praying for things led by the Holy Spirit or whatever God brings to our mind in order to make intercession for the things He wants to pray for. So we're praying with both, and that's what we need in order to be effective. And God wants us to do these things. It's interesting that Galatians chapter 4, verse 19 tells us something. My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. This travailing in birth, what's all that about? It's a word which means to feel the pains of childbirth or like travailing in childbirth. Wait a minute. How, you mean to tell me I'm going to go into labor to have Christ formed in someone? Not physical labor spiritual labor in the realm of the spirit you're releasing spiritual power so it's like travailing in that in the natural for you women who've had children you know what we're talking about when you travail it is going to be intense it is going to be rhythmic it is going to be uh, con consistent, and what are you doing when you go into travail? 
you're getting ready, the body is getting ready to release the baby from the body's hold, right? The baby's coming out from the body, not going to be in the body anymore. It's going to be out, you know, it's going to be birthed. What's going to happen in the realm of the spirit? You are going to release somebody or some place from Satan's hold, which is what you're doing when you're travailing in the spirit. You're going to release something because that's what travails, the purpose of travail is to release something from one place to another. And that's what you're doing in the realm of the spirit. And notice when it says travail and birth again. The word again is this word pelin. And by the way, it is a form of the word. It's, it's, a, it's from the word that means wrestle in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. In fact, I'll show this to you. Look at this number, 3825. It's this word palin. I'll come back here in a moment. So you remember the 3825. Here is Ephesians 6, verse 12, when it talks about wrestling. It shows you about what wrestling is. It's the word number 3823, pele. It's simply a different sort of form of this particular word. It's a form of it. It's actually this main word here. And then when we go back over to Galatians 4.19, you'll see that this word actually comes from this word meaning to wrestle. I'll show it to you. Again, again the word. Notice it says probably from the same as 38, excuse me, 38.23. That's the number that we just saw that means wrestle. Through the idea of oscillatory repetition. Because again, what does again mean? Why do they put again? Because this is referring to something again and again and again and again. Renewal and repetition of action. In other words, you're continuing in the travailing until you see the results. When you went into travail to have a child, you didn't decide, well, we're going to stop this for today and we'll just think about it another day. No. Once it starts, guess what? It's happening, and you continue on until the birth, right? It's the same thing in the spirit, travail, spiritual travail. When you enter into travailing, which will happen when you pray in tongues a lot, there's times when God can bring a, a tremendous intensity out of you, a, a, a releasing, even on the inside, you almost feel like you're birthing something into being in the realm of the spirit. You're releasing something in the realm of the spirit. It'll be intense. It'll be rhythmic. It'll be repetitious, as they put, points it out, even through the idea, as it says down here, to be like oscillatory repetition, oscillating, something continuous. So it's going to be rhythm, it's going to be steady, it's going to be intense to release say, someone or some place from Satan's hold. This is when you get into intense intercession. And this is what sometimes it takes to break through bondages. In fact, he's saying about until Christ is even formed in people. The tremendous intercession that they were involved in. This is what God wants for us. You and I are to put our mouth in operation. So what are we going to do as intercessors in putting our mouth in operation? First of all, you've got to know you have authority. We didn't give you this scripture. We should give it to you. Luke chapter 10. You've been given authority over all the power of the enemy. Behold, I give unto you power. It's the Greek word exousia, which means authority. Young's corrects the error. It means authority. To tread on serpents, scorpions, and over all the power. This is truly the word power, which means is dunamis, which does mean power. That's the Greek word for power. I give unto you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. So you got authority. So you're going to use your authority. That's exactly what an intercessor is going to do. So you as an intercessor with authority and power over all the power of the enemy are supposed to put the authority and the power of God in operation. How are you going to do it? You're going to put on the whole armor of God, which causes the through the word in you, it causes the power of God to be resonant within you regarding what you're to do as an intercessor, all these type of scriptures. You are going to engage in vengeance and zeal to attack the spirits in the realm of the heavens to destroy their works. You're going to pay refury to those enemies. You're going to drive at the enemies 
and you're going to destroy them. You're going to root them out, pull them down, destroy, throw it out. How do I do that? You speak it. I throw it down in Jesus' name. I bind you. I cast you down in Jesus' name. I command you to be removed in Jesus' name. You speak commanding words, because remember, we command the work of his hands. Otherwise, don't be one of those ones, well, I'm asking the Father, Father, I would, will you please remove such and such? It doesn't work that way. You, you have the authority, he told you to speak. You have to do the commanding and tell them to leave. You don't ask the Father to get rid of things. That may sound like a nice thing to do, but it's not appropriate, it's not accurate because he's given you authority and authority is released through someone who has an earth suit you and me physical body operating in this earth and you are how is God doing it though in the name of Jesus when you speak in the name of Jesus you're putting him in operation <coughs> so <coughs> we need to speak commanding words in the name of Jesus so we're going to we have the keys the means of access to the rule and the reign of the heavens Whatever we might bind, the angels will go in operation. It shall be, having been bound on the heavens, because they're going to do it. We're going to loose it, untie their hold. It shall be, having been loosed, untied in the heavens by those angels that confront those demons and deal with them. Now you say, well, it didn't happen right away. That's because you need to keep doing things until you see the results. The enemies have ability to resist. Remember with Daniel, he didn't pray some quick prayer and then the angel showed up right away. No, 21 days. That's why you pray without ceasing. It was 21 days before that angel finally got through because there was warfare. That's why you pray continually. We're invading the rule and the reign of the heavens with violence to destroy their works. We're wrestling. We are engaging in spiritual warfare prevailing in the spirit, fighting against these enemies to destroy them. We do remit the sins in order to stop the works of why the demons have gotten up there, the evil spirits have gotten into the operation. And then we're going to cast down, throw down, root out, fall upon them to their destruction. And we're also going to pray in tongues because we want the Holy Spirit to pray for things that you and I don't know what to pray for. He knows everything. So we're going to pray in tongues and the Holy Spirit is going to operate through us to speak all the things that need to be spoken. And as we do so, God is going to move mightily and we're going to release mighty power and force and exactly what the Holy Spirit wants to pray as well, as well as what we know to speak to destroy the works of the enemy. And the angels are going to go into operation that are mighty and powerful and will release the mighty power of God to destroy their mighty and force. And then as we continue to pray in tongues, God will even take you into times of travailing in the Spirit to release a person or place from Satan's hold. And sometimes it takes that intense intercession and warfare to break through in the realm of the Spirit. It's work, spiritual work. But God uses us mightily to accomplish these things. So we've looked at some things tonight about the application of the words of our mouth, because it's one thing just to say the importance of the words of our mouth, which is important, the messages we gave, but we need to know, how do I put it in operation? So we're going to praise God, we're going to bless others, and we're going to, as we talked about just now, engage in warfare intercession by speaking the words that he tells us to speak to stop the works of the enemy and to kick all these spirits out of the heavenlies. If the body of Christ will do this, things could change overnight or maybe in 21 days, I don't know, or a few, a couple months time or so, it could change. Certainly it will change if the body of Christ would engage in warfare intercession. Most people out there speaking about the negatives and all the terrible things that are happening and all that. Some would say, well, judgment's coming, you know. Well, why don't we intercede and destroy the works of the enemy and see God be released so he brings what he purposes. He didn't want to bring judgment. He delights in mercy. He wants to see things turn around in all areas. It takes the church engaging in intercession. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you. You've given me a mouth to speak words. You will be with my mouth when your words are in my mouth. I am going to speak with the authority you've given to me. 
the words of God that have power within them that release you to accomplish your mighty works. I thank you. I will make my mouth work for you. I will praise and worship you. I will bless others. I will not let my mouth speak evil things. And I will engage as an intercessor. I thank you. I'm going to bind, loose, throw down, cast out, destroy, root out all these spirits in the heavenlies. And I thank you. I will have zeal. My garments of vengeance are on. I'm going to speak with boldness in the name of Jesus. The angels are going to hearken to the word I'm speaking as long as it's accurate. And when I speak, the power of God will go into operation and the enemies will be destroyed. I will pray in tongues as well as my understanding in my mind. I will release your mighty power and you will accomplish all things in the realm of the Spirit to destroy the works of the enemy and to see the rule and the reign of God come into the hands of the church under the Lordship of Jesus. I thank you, Lord. I'm going to take my place as an intercessor and I will pray in tongues and even enter into travailing in the Spirit to see you bring forth a release from Satan's hold and break the bondages in people's lives. Thank you, Lord, for using me mightily as I do what this word has declared this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, this is all in the Spirit. Say, so, well, when I, I don't feel anything, it's not a feeling thing. Well, I didn't see anything happen immediately. It's not a seeing thing. It's all in the realm of the Spirit, and when it's accomplished in the Spirit, it'll show up. Daniel was praying for 21 days, didn't see a thing, didn't hear a thing. Nobody showed up. All of a sudden, he showed up when the job was done. When the battle's won, the change will come, and we'll see the victory. God wants us to be his intercessors. Father, I thank you for all you brought forth tonight. Thank you that we are learning the application of the words of our mouth to do what you've commanded us to do, not only to praise and worship you and to bless others, but also to be your intercessors to see your mighty work be accomplished. Thank you that we have ears to hear. We're going to take hold of this and be doers of it. And we praise you and thank you for all that you're going to accomplish through our mouth as we speak forth your word and do exactly what you say. Thank you for much fruit as we hear and do this word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God.